that lies behind, setting our hearts on the prize, always keeping our eyes on our Lord Jesus, We're running the race to win, all the way to the end, laying down every sin that would seek to hinder us, we'll be time of offering. This is mainly for our church family. There's an offering plate in the back, so feel free to get up during the next song or on your way out at the end of the service. If you want to give online, the website is listed on the back of your bulletin. Or if you prefer to mail it in, the church mailing address is listed on the front of your bulletin. If you are a guest today, thank you for coming. Your presence here is enough. We just ask that you fill out a visitor information card and drop it in the offering plate in the back. Now we will pray for the offering at this time. Now let's go to the Lord in, in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today. And um, we pray that you would give us strength for the week and we would be reinvigorated, Lord. And pray that you would guide us um, and just, um, just reveal yourself to us on this week, Lord. Uh, we pray for the tithes and offerings, Lord, and we are thankful for the many blessings that you've blessed us with, and I pray that we would be able to give back with a cheerful heart, Lord, um, and we thank you um, for your son who gave the uh, ultimate sacrifice by dying on the cross for our sins, Lord, and I pray that we would have um, uh, gratitude, Lord, for everything that you've done for us and continue to do for us. I pray all these things in your son's name, amen.
at this time we're going to go to prayer and Bernard will be doing the corporate prayer today. Happy Sunday. How's uh, everybody doing? I put some slides in there. Did it go? Thank you. So welcome. Um, we've been out for the last two weeks, me and my wife. That's a picture of me and my lovely wife. If you can pronounce the name of the place, that's where I was born and I grew up. So uh, this is actually the fourth um, airplane ride uh, that we did because you know if you've been to the Philippines it's a group of islands so you have to so we flew from San Francisco to Manila and then Manila to another airport visited some relatives and then we flew to this airport so I got some uh, teenager slang in there TYL thank you Lord for the safe travels <laughs> so I've seen a lot of our colleagues members here are traveling also so bless them Next slide, please. All right, I'm gonna promote this one. I know um, Brianna reminded us next Sunday if we could invite one person or one neighbor, we'll take care of the burgers, we'll take care of the, um, the, uh, the grilling. So we, ha we have some nice um, picnic here at the church. And if your neighbor, if they get kids, we will have um, water slides and bounce house. Or if they got grandkids, it's easier, I think, to convince the um, grandparents to bring their grandkids to church that this Sunday coming. And if you're lucky, you might have the same shirt as I have right now. All right? I'm just joking. But there should be some shirts. Um, next slide. All right. Now... I'm not being political this morning, but um, it's in my heart to share Philippians 4, chapter 4, 6 to 7. And I think um, it's on the bulletin that Pastor Steve will also do his sermon on Philippians, the book of Philippians. I'm just surprised and a little bit happy that the, uh, one of the political parties, this actually came out into my social media. They actually posted this, the Grand Old Party. Philippians 4, 6, which is really um, encouraging, right? Anthony, I talked to Anthony earlier today, and there's some, a lot of uh, things that's been happening to our country, but this one is a um, really good sign that not all is lost. So I'm just going to read Philippians uh, chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say, it again rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's a really good message. So uh, if you've got any problems, rejoice and pray. That's, that's what it says. Now, before I'm going to read some prayer requests, do we have a prayer request right now? Nope. So I'm just going to read this. Uh, please pray for Christy Pfeiffer as she continues to look for a job. That's Pastor Sean's wife. So we'll, we'll pray for that one. And then we'll pray for Linda Furtick, um for her health. And we, we know that Linda um, is, is suffering from a couple of... Um, um, health issues and uh, we're happy to have Charlotte today this morning God bless you Charlotte well glad that you're, you're here with us now let's pray <clears throat> Lord we thank you and we praise you for bringing us safely um, today here in your place we praise you for your goodness to us we praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you for your loving kindness. 
We praise you for sending us your son to heal us from our sins. Thank you, Jesus. We pray for Christy Pfeiffer for her job search. And also we praise God for giving uh, Simara a really nice and wonderful job. We also pray for Linda for her health. We pray for all of those who are sick. We pray for healing, Lord. We also pray for our church, your church. We pray that you enlighten our community through our preaching of the gospel. We pray for our city. We pray for our youth. We pray for our colleges and schools who are starting to be back on campus again. We welcome everyone. We also pray for our state. We pray for our country. We pray for healing with our politics. And we pray for our oppressed brothers and sisters who are being persecuted right now for being a Christian. We pray for your guidance and protection. Lord, we also pray for those who are not here. Make them safe if they're traveling. And if they are having any family problems, please help them mend those problems. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Steve as he preached your word this morning. And we thank you for the leadership of Valley Bible Church. We thank you for the worship team. And we thank you for all of our members who work behind the scenes for your glory. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bernard, for that great introduction there. We could uh, almost pronounce the benediction, right? Because you have uh, given us a, a good admonition and you've set our hearts up in prayer. Thank you. You can open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to continue our study in the book of Philippians. And you should have an outline uh, in your bulletin if you'd like to use that. I'd like to welcome each of you that are coming to us via the internet as well. We're glad you join us, and we hope that there'll come a day that you can join us here in the on the campus again. The um, Pfeifers are doing well. Uh, Pastor Sean has let me know that uh, Andrew has been placed in a transitional home. Uh, it's uh, a place that will prepare him properly for uh, a, a more permanent home. So they need prayer. Now, you can imagine having a young man in your home and taking care of him for 18 years, and then all of a sudden he's not there. So they're going through the, the grief process, actually, of having their son not there. That's, uh, that's hard on them, and it's hard on Anthony, although he's... I mean, uh, Andrew, although he is, uh, according to Sean, doing quite well. But of course, with Pastor Sean um, not being the caregiver now, because he's in a facility, he's also looking for a position, looking for work. So be in prayer for uh, Christy and for Pastor Sean as they um, look at this new chapter in their lives. So... Um, Today we're going to continue in our study here on uh, what I'm calling uh, essentials. Let's see, well, maybe it's going to be up here somewhere. <laughs> you guys have the... This is not it. Um, we're going to talk about how to be a blessing today. Here we go. How to be a blessing from Philippians chapter... 1 verses 8 through 11 and it's still frozen but we'll see if there's there's something coming to life okay <laughs> and we'll be looking at these pa this passage together 
let's go back here see if we can there we go there's where I was gonna start right here somewhere essentials of a healthy healthy church okay technology that can cause us lots of grief can't it um, so this is our third study from the book of Philippians and I uh, put this slide up here and it reminds us that um, some people just exude joy uh, other people are just posing for a dental commercial. <laughs> That's actually where I got this picture. But um, I can remember one time my dad said to me, he said, Steve, get that chip off your shoulder. And he really took me back because the idiom refers to somebody that has a very belligerent attitude. And apparently I was not exuding joy in my home. And my dad gave me a good... Uh, a good lecture just in a in a couple of words but we're going to talk today about being a blessing and so the title of the message is how to be a blessing there's a whole books written on this subject so it, we're just going to touch a couple of things here this morning but if you go back to the book of Genesis the first thing you notice that Abraham is chosen by God for a special job and what was it it was that God could pour his life, his blessing into, into Abraham for the purpose of him doing what? Being a blessing to others. So God's program from the beginning is that we would be a blessing, but that we wouldn't just hoard that blessing, we would share it with those around us. Um, five times we see here that he mentions a blessing. And you've probably often heard this phrase or this benediction at the end of a service may the lord bless you and protect you may the lord smile on you and be gracious to you may the lord show his favor and give you his peace that's the famous uh, blessing that was taught to aaron so as we come to our study today we're going to see that paul here in the first chapter is blessing the church in philippi and so we're going to read the passage together. I'll read it here in, first, uh, in Philippians 1, verses 8 through 11. He says, God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's the reading of God's word. Shall we pray together again? Lord, we thank you already for the prayers that have been shared. And we also lay upon, uh, lay at your feet, Lord, the request for Pastor Sean. Your blessing would be upon he and Christy and, and their sons, Jeremy and Andrew. Our hearts go out to them as they make these uh, critical transitions in their lives. And we pray, Lord, that you would just go before them and grant them your direction and your blessing. And Lord, as we look at your word today, uh, may this not be my word, may it be your word, and may you, by the Holy Spirit, speak to each of us individually and personally about some way that we can be a blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we learned in the last two studies that the church in Philippi was born on a river bank. You remember that for those that have been traveling. Uh, now, 10 years later, Paul is writing this letter back to them as a word of encouragement. And last week, we saw how the, the church, we should view ourselves and how we should view the church. Right there in the first verse, Paul says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so recognizing that all of us are just servants is a great way to establish relationships in the church. I'm here to serve you. I'm not here for myself. Too often people go to church and they say, well, there was nothing in it for me. Well, what did they do to give? Did they come to serve? No, they came to get. So we have to start with that. And then, then he says, to the saints in Christ Jesus. That's another problem we face in church. People say, oh, I won't go there because uh, there's somebody there I don't like or somebody that does something 
that I don't agree with or they just rub me the wrong way. Well, uh, if we would view those people as saints, if we would think of them uh, in the literal definition of the word as those that are set apart by God, they were brought here for a purpose to recognize that, you know, the church is not an accident. It's here because God put us here. And you are here today uh, by God's appointment. Maybe you thought you chose, and you did, but that's the, that's the uh, dichotomy of theology in the scriptures, you know, that we have choice, God gives us choice, but also he directs our paths. And so, view people in the church as saints, and you're here to serve, and you'll see God do great things in our midst. Let's, um, let's look and see how Paul was a blessing to the church, or, or how he prayed a blessing upon them. He said, it's right for me to feel this way about all you, since you have, I have you in my heart, for whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Paul had a real heart, didn't he, to that church in Philippi, and he was writing back to them, uh, sharing his love for them. Now, the first secret of blessing to, to, is to discover really the source of our love. You say, I can't be a servant. I can't view others as a saint. Maybe you need to work on this. You need to work on having a supernatural love for others. And you've all heard of the bear hug, and I guess that's where it comes from right there. But uh, in your outline, you have a little blank. If you want to fill in the, the little words there, you can. The first thought here is to have a supernatural love for others. Now, you can love people, and I think there's a lot of uh, you know, love out there. But this is talking about a unique kind of love. It's the, lo the affection of Jesus Christ. And Paul, really, he says, let me, let me call God as my witness how greatly I long for you, not with my love, but what? With the affection of Jesus Christ. So you can love people, you can love them as saints in the, with the power and the ability of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we would do that, we would have a healthy church. End of story, pronounce the benediction, let's go home, okay? Oh, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm going to say a few more things. Um, it's a love beyond human ability. Here's a lot of verses that talk about love. Uh, it says over there in 1 Corinthians 13, Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. We can't love like that, can we? It's going to take something deeper, and that's where... The Lord Jesus comes in, the affection of Jesus Christ in and through us. And, and it says in Romans 5.5 5, that God has poured out his love into our hearts. If you're a believer, you have God's love living within you, don't you? So it should come out. If you don't have the love of Christ coming out, maybe you ought to check to see what you put in there if you haven't put Jesus first in your life. Well, uh, these, are, these are tools uh, here's another one. I get a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. For uh, So you must love one another. Now look at the next phrase there. By this all men will know that you're my disciples. How are people going to know Jesus if they see it in you and I? No. So uh, let's talk about some ways that we can love. Now this is not rocket scientist, science. You know this. We can love with our words. Okay. Uh, the first way is you can show this. And this is what Paul is doing in writing this letter back to the church. He's what I call breaking the sound barrier. And it's so hard sometimes to just express appreciation and love. I don't know why it is that way, but Chuck Yeager, back in 1947, uh, was a test pilot for the United States Air Force, and they put him in a little rocket plane out there on the Salton Sea, or out, in, uh, not in the Salton Sea, but down in the Tehachapi area. And uh, he rocketed off in, well, actually, they put him in a, 
a B-29 bomber and they dropped this rocket plane at 29,000 feet and he shot off into the horizon. And they didn't know if Chuck Yeager was going to disintegrate into space or if he was going to come back. Well, at 662 miles an hour, he broke the sound barrier, the first person ever to do that. And, and the, the scientists didn't know, how, you know, if this, what was going to happen when they did this. But my point is this, he broke the sound barrier and often it's just about as difficult for us as Christians to break the sound barrier and tell somebody of our love and our appreciation for them. We just think it's assumed. Or we just think that they, 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 it comes out by osmosis or something. But sometimes we need to add words to our feelings. And Paul says here, you know, you, uh, he calls God as his witness that this is how much he loved them. Now, when was the last time that you heard some words of affirm affirmation? You can probably remember the time somebody said, you did a great job, or you're good at that. You know that sometimes you hear the stories of teachers, or, or from students, that it was a teacher's affirmation in the fifth grade, maybe, that set the course of their life. That's often how few these times are that we receive affirmation. How many times have you heard, I want people to know that I really appreciate you. But here's the other side. How many of us are giving words af of affirmation? I heard a brief uh, affirmation this morning already about the praise team. And it was remarkable to me the, the amount of sound that came out of these four people up here this morning. Uh, you have blessed us with your talents. How many times uh, have you said to somebody, you know, I couldn't, but we did. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you. Or to somebody, I know I can count on you, or you made a great call. Too often we get together and we start sharing our thoughts and somebody will say something and we'll say, well, that's a crazy thought. When we really ought to say, you know, you've broadened our perspective. <laughs> you've given us a new thought. Now here's the scary part. Jesus says that one of these days we're going to be held accountable for our words. And over in Matthew, uh, 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 Anthony referenced this on Friday night in our Bible study. He says, but I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of in the day of judgment. So even our, the words we say in passing, I remember the song by Gordon Lightfoot, did she mention my name just in passing when the lights were low and so forth. Did, did the thought of her come across my mind? Well, and the, the point here is, you know, even our little innocuous words, someday we're going to have to be held accountable for before the Lord. So we should pray every day, shouldn't we? Set a watch, Lord, before my lips that I would speak things that honor and uplift you. You know, the person that wrote the little ditty, sticks and stones break my bones, but words will never hurt me, was probably deaf. <laughs> because we know that what words do hurt, they penetrate deep. Yeah, you can be cut and it will heal, but sometimes those words will sit there and ferment for years. A former attender of this church, thank you for coming to church today. Maybe you can do that as you leave this morning. Maybe you can say, you know, I just respect you for being you. I'm not trying to fix you. I love you just like you are. Think about it. Words of affirmation. Now, can we say those in an empty way and not really mean it in our heart? Well, that's why Paul went on and he says, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in what? Knowledge and depth of insight. So do a little research huh, and make your words purposeful so that when you say them, you're saying them from your heart, not just as a cliche. So words, uh, our words are important, but also not only is our words, it's our actions, okay? Words need to be act backed up with actions. So the second little blank there is actions. And we see this over in 1 John 3.18. My children... We should love people not only with words and talk, 
but by our actions and true caring. Now this is basic, isn't it? You know this. But do we practice it? Do we practice it? Again, I said we need to break that sound barrier. Maybe you remember in the play My Fair Lady, Eliza is being courted by Freddie, and she laments with these classic lines. She says, words, words, I'm so sick of words. Don't talk of stars burning above. If you're in love, show me. Don't talk of love lasting through time. Make me no undying vow. Show me now. <laughs> If you really want to show your love, then it must be done in deed, in deeds. You need to say it, and you need to show it. So what can we do to show our love with deeds? Um, you know, it's, it's the little things that destroy us, isn't it? And we... We often think, well, you know, especially sitting here in church, well, yeah, I can do something big and important and I'll plan it right now. But what about the daily things that you do? As I said earlier, you need to set a watch before your lips uh, so that every day and every word speaks uh, purposefully and meaningfully with insight, knowledge, and true love. Here's a, a little idiom again that you've probably heard. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. You could ask 10 people off the street, have you heard that statement? Yeah, and nine of them wouldn't know where it came from. Did you know that comes right from the Bible? It was the words of King Solomon. And he wrote, catch all the foxes, those little foxes before they ruin the vineyard of love. That's literally from the New Living Translation what it says. What's the, what's the background? What's the backstory on that? Well, the little foxes are small animals that cannot reach the hanging grapes, so they gnaw off the vines, and the grapes fall to the ground so they can eat the fruit. Their actions cause the farmer to lose a vine that took years to mature. And what Solomon is saying, it's the little actions that have the greatest impact. Here are some ways that you and I can be a blessing, okay? Some little things that we can do. And we've already talked about giving a compliment. So we don't need to go back to that one again. I <laughs> read the story of a pilot who had been on a long flight and the crew was tired. Top it off, they had a really rough landing. And with this particular airline, the, they had a policy that the pilot must stand at the door um, and, and, you know, thank all those who, who flew with him. Have you been on a plane and seen, seen that experience? I have. Well, a pilot was dreading this routine because of the rough landing, but he stood faithfully by as he tried to make eye contact with those passing. They just shuffled off. Then came the last passenger, a little lady, elderly lady. And she hobbled up and she says, can I ask you a question? Sure, answered the captain, looking for some form of affirmation. She looked him straight in the face and she said, Did we land or were we shot down? He didn't get it, did he? Proverbs says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Now if you Google that phrase on the internet, you're going to see lots of beautiful pictures of frames with this very statement in it. And I chose today not to do that because, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read a book and then I see the character, it's totally different than what I imagined. So I'm just going to have you close your eyes and think for a second about that statement and what kind of a picture do you have in your mind that your words could be like apples of gold in settings of silver. That's one way that we can be a blessing give a compliment. Secondly, we can tackle a task. Now, um, all of us can do something to show our love. Love is more than just words. It's what you do. So we have some doctors around here. A patient went to see the doctor and the doctor said this. He says, you're in terrible shape. 
you've got to do something about it. First, tell your wife to cook more nutritious meals. Stop working like a dog. Also, inform her that you're going to be making a budget and she has to stick to it. And have her keep the kids off your back so you can relax. Unless there are some changes in your life, you're going to be dead in a month. Well, this man, he timidly said to the doctor, he says, Doctor, you know, it would be a little more authoritative if that came from you. Would you please call my wife? So he did. And he went home, and she came bursting out of the door as he went into the driveway. She was wailing, and she says, Honey, she says, Honey, the doctor just called, and he says, You only have 30 days to live. Okay. Did you get it? <laughs> The point is, you know, we're not willing to do something about it. And uh, I'm not going to try to boast, but when I retired, I thought, you know, there's maybe some things I could do to help Lorraine. She didn't retire. And she has those grandkids every day. And she doesn't just, you know, take care of the kids. She's right on them the whole way through. She's making little little Einsteins out of those kids. Uh, little Nora, she reads, reads read, read before she ever got to kindergarten. And little Ella now is not even two, and she's counting. And so, uh, you know, Lorraine gives 100% to those kids, and there's, they're, they're talking like you know, Blue Streak, because she just sits there and, on the couch, and she talks to them, and she reads to them, and she shows them pictures, and and does all kinds of things. Well, so I thought, you know, there's something I can do. I could, this is hard, you know, and I shouldn't say it in front of everybody, but I decided I'm going to do the evening dishes. So now it's on record, you know. Um, and you'll have to ask her. But I but I thought, that's, that's what she, after she takes care of the kids all day, then she's got to stand in the kitchen and f fix a meal. The least I could do, the least I could do is just uh, clean up the dishes. It doesn't take long. You know, but it's a way, it's a task that I can do to demonstrate love. It's beyond just saying I love you, it's doing it. Now, I know that in the love languages, you know, there's different ways that we show love, and my love language is serving. And so that's why I got into trouble here as your pastor many times. I'm, I'm willing to do something, even if it's just for the Lord, and, and you don't need to don't know about it. But uh, that's just the way we're wired. But we should be... You know, we should be taking um, some, doing some tasks. In fact, on Friday night, I was, uh, after Friday night Bible study, I said to everybody, take off, go, 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 I'll lock up. And so, because I hadn't forgot my phone, I had to go over to the office and punch in the numbers. And I came out and I went out to, to close the gate. Well, guess what? One of your members here had already gone through the gate and was parked there. And when I got through the gate, he says, Pastor, let me help you with the gate. That was Bernard. I shouldn't name it, but now he lost his reward. <laughs> he got it here. But anyway, um, my point is this. We all could do something to demonstrate our love. And then the third thing is to fulfill a promise. All of us have made promises that we haven't kept. If you, um, you know, if you doubt that, you just ask your wife. <laughs> they have remarkable memory on some of those things. Uh, Psalm 45, 11 says, He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. That's in the King James. Here's what it says in the NLT. They keeps their promises even when it hurts. So if you make a promise, follow through. Do it. That's a way that you can show love. And then here's another one. Uh, you can forgive a failure. Well, that's hard. Um, I've been speaking out at Stevenson Chapel on occasion. And one Sunday after the service, I said to the folks, I said, you know, I come and I select the topic here. Is it, what would you like to hear? Without a hesitation, they said, we want a sermon on forgiveness. I mean, I mean, it just came right out, just Bingo, that was the word. And so I did. I preached a message there on forgiveness. And I spoke, I got that message in my satchel now, so if you want to hear it sometime, maybe we can. But if you want to be a blessing, look over, overlook a failure. 
You know, it's so easy to nurse those little things, those little foxes. Remember this story that Jesus told of the speck and the beam? You know, it's this, they're the same size, it's just the perspective. We say, well, that person did such a, you know, it's, what they did is a big thing. Well, it's a big thing when you got it right here, but you hold it out here. It might, it may, in the light of eternity, it might not be that big a deal. I know it's hard to let somebody go who has hurt you without some retribution. And, you know, you need to forgive and move on. And while, while I was preparing this or thinking about this this week, up on the news on Thursday popped this story of Frederick Woods, who's just being released from prison after spending 40 years behind bars. Now, Frederick Woods probably doesn't mean anything to any of you here today, but he was one of the three people that hijacked the Chowchilla school bus, and they drove those kids over to a rock quarry and buried them alive and asked for a, a ransom of $5 million. That's Frederick Woods that was just released. Well, um, Larry Park was one of those kids. He was six years old. He's now 50 years old. And he was asked what he thought of the release. And he admitted to drug, struggling with drugs and mental health issues for years. And he says he blamed Woods, and I quote, for every bad thing that ever happened in my life, end quote. He added, and I quote, every single day of my life, in every bad circumstance, I blamed the kidnappers, end quote. Now, it was a traumatic experience. But guess what happened to Larry Park? He found Jesus. Let that sink in for a minute. I mean, he really became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, now I'm 12 years sober. I put down the drugs. I started on a journey toward forgiveness for the kidnappers. And it was not an easy journey. I'm quoting him. It was not an easy journey. He has, set, has since met with all three of his kidnappers. Two of them he took to dinner at the Black Bear Diner in Fresno. And he goes, and I quote, I have offered them forgiveness, and I have asked them for their forgiveness because no one deserves to be hated for 40 years. It released him from that prison of blaming other people for his problems. But here's the kicker. And this is in, you can look at this up on Fox Digital. He states, I give thanks for those three men. What? He's thanking God for the three men who put him through such pain because they have shown me that a leopard can change its spots and that we can be something different and better. Wow, the power of forgiveness that we need to work on in our lives. Your forgiveness may be the blessing that the best blessing that they will ever receive. So, forgive. But let me just squeeze one more in there. Embrace a trial. Okay, embrace a trial. Now, if you look at your bulletin, you're going to notice that next week I'm going to talk about the hidden benefits of trials. So we're not going to cover this one today. You've got to come back next week. Okay? Let's go on to the last point here. This is a, a verse in reference to trials. If you don't make it next week, it says, Blessed he who patiently endures trials, for when he has stood the test, he will gain the victor's crown, even the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. There in James 1, chapter 12. I often forget some people are watching this on the internet and don't have the slides behind me. Uh, so let's summarize here. We have, we have words, okay? We can love with words. We can love with actions, but there's a third thing we can do. And if you were here last Sunday, you know what I told you. I gave you the answer. We can pray. We can pray. And so we're going to talk about the three ways that I said last week that you can pray for other believers. Um, the first way is that we can pray for others is to well, uh, pray that they'll grow 
in love. What I did here was I, Pastor Sean had his Seanology, so what I have is uh, my free translation of, of our verses here today in Philippians chapter 1, verses 8 to 11. So there's no quotes on this because this isn't from the Scripture. This is my free translation. This is my way of taking the Scriptures and praying back to God. And actually, this can be my prayer for you today, okay? So here's what I'm going to pray. I call upon God as my witness with the affection of Jesus Christ coursing through my veins that your love would continue to mature in real knowledge and discernment and that you would strive for excellence and live blameless lives overflowing with the character of Jesus Christ until he returns to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Now, am I faithful to the text? Let's hope so. We look at the text and we see that the first thing he prayed for was that their love would grow. Look at verse 9 there. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Abound to me is to overflow. Uh, and here's Paul encouraging them to have that kind of love. On Friday night a week ago, we were talking about love. And one of our members referenced this verse. Michelle talked about the four dimensions of love. And we see it there in Romans 8.39. How can we abound in love? How can we show this love? Well, by the depth and the height and the breadth and the width of our love, love for the Lord. And this is not an isolated text. All the way through the scriptures, we see love. What was the first fruit of the Spirit, mentioned there in Galatians 5.22. Isn't it the fruit of the Spirit? Let's go on. Uh, Christ's love compels us, Paul said, because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. So we have a, com a compulsion from God to love. And it says, if you love one another, what are you going to do? You're going to prove to the world that you're his disciples. And now these three remain, faith, hope, or faith, hope, and love, but what? The greatest is what? Is love important in the church? Of course it is. So, grow in love, and secondly, that they would exercise discernment. They would exercise discernment. Verse 10 goes on and says, whoops, I don't have it there, but it says here in my notes, approve the things that are excellence. Uh, to that you must distinguish, not so much between the right and wrong, but between the better and the best, between the good and the excellent. Do you pray for a discerning spirit? Do you pray for valley, that they would exercise a discerning spirit as they look for a new pastor? Um, some of you have big decisions ahead, and we need to pray for discernment. Uh, just an aside here on this, it says approve the things that are excellent. What caught my eye in the Weiss word study on that word approve was the fact that that word was used in Greece at the time of Paul's writing to put, it's the same word that's used to talk about a, a doctor who had passed all of their medical exams and they were now board certified and they could hang out their shingle. And if you've gone to any, to any doctor's office, you know that when you're sitting in there, there's always all these diplomas on the walls and uh, from the various places they, they've worked to achieve their effort. And it's a lot. It's a lot of work. But that stamp of approval is, you know, that, that certification that comes through. And that's what Paul is using right here. And in the same way, he says, we study and we're tested and we go through trials and temptation. And, and these responses strengthen our approval with God and make us a blessing to others. And then the third way is that they would be a good testimony in the community. Again, a great prayer for Valley as we look for a new pastor that, you know, this is the healthy church is a church that has a good testimony in the community. This is how Paul prayed for the Philippians. I'm going to go on through this real quick. I'm going to add a fourth, okay? This is the, these are the three I gave you last Sunday, but no, no charge. Okay, we'll throw in one more. That they would be fruitful. Now really, this doesn't have to be there because if you do the first three, what's going to happen? 
Fruit is the natural result. We don't produce fruit. We do the things that are necessary, and God is the one that produces the fruit. So Paul says here in verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And that's my desire. That's my prayer for Valley. And I look at you as I uh, pray and think of a basket full of fruit on the middle of the kitchen table, overflowing with peaches and nectarines and, and plums and grapes and all those things. And I say, that's God's plan. That's God's desire for Valley. Do you believe that? Do you pray that? I hope you do. Because I think there's great days ahead. Now what could the fruit be? The fruit could be the salvation of family members. It could be the spirit of love in your heart and in your life. So let, let's conclude here. Paul has given us really a pattern for blessing, hasn't he? Look again at your handout. Do you want to make a difference in the life of someone else? Begin by showing love. Show it by what you say, show it by what you do, and then pray a blessing. Pray earnestly, pray faithfully, pray daily. Pray that they'll grow in love. Pray that they'll choose the best. Pray that they'll have holy character. Pray that they will do what is right. You can put these principles into practice and be a blessing here at Valley. And as I said, Paul's prayer for Valley is my prayer for you. This is really a book about joy. And I'll close with the same verse I used last week. Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Look at that. A path of life, fullness of joy, and pleasures forevermore. Don't you want that? Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, speak to our hearts today. Maybe there's somebody here who hasn't put their faith in you. May they even now ask you to be their Lord and Savior. May they ask you to fill them with your love. Maybe there's somebody here struggling with one of these issues. Help them, Lord, to be an overcomer. And Lord, help us as a church to leave here as servants, viewing each other as saints. And go before us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Steve. We're going to all stand and sing our closing song today, Walk by Faith. And uh, pray that we ought just meditate on those words, how to be blessing to others and how to be uh, fruitful in our lives. And we could model that after um, our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's all stand if you're able to. We're going to sing our closing song, Walk by Faith.
Aaron, and I'll invite you back next week. Don't forget, there's a barbecue after the service. Bring your meat and uh, share it, and we'll have a good time together. Invite a friend to join us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
Hello, hello, hello. There you go. 